it's time to recognize our seniors for this year. First Timothy um, chapter four, uh, verse twelve, and and this is for you guys that are young, guys and gals that are young. It says, "Let no man despise your youth, but be you you be an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity." in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And so when you do that, when you're an example of that, you witness that, uh, you know, they can say whatever they want, but the Lord is pleased, it's with you, and don't let anybody despise what you share, what you say, what you do, just because you're young. And they're out there, trust me, and you may have already encountered them, but just be encouraged and know that the Lord is well pleased and loves you. And, <coughs> <laughs> He's strong and very yeah. courageous. Anyone else? Yes, I just want to. Sorry, I see you guys. Uh, I just want to pray blessings over you all. Um, I just pray in the name of Jesus that God will reveal His plan for your lives to you, and that you will go out there wholeheartedly. And you will do what God has called you to do. Of what someone's trying to do, you will not follow. You will stay focused. You will stay faithful. You will continue to stretch the word with your whole heart. And you will seek God early in the morning. And you will pray the worship him early in the morning. And that will establish your day. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that you guys will continue to. I claim Psalms 112 over your lives. That you guys are mighty uh, men on the earth. Your seed will be mighty up on the earth. Yes. You will continue to look for God in everything that you do. Um, when you don't know what to do, your eyes will be on one. Yes. Yes. You will ask for wisdom. And he yes. will give it. And you will intercede yes. for those yes. that are your friends and people that are around you that you know that are not living a life according to the word of God. And you will pray because he said by the cleanliness of your hands, he will deliver Amen. And you will continue to move forward. And I see wisdom over you guys, from Amen. here to over you. Blessings. I thank God for the anointing that's over you. That you will continue to decree and declare the word of God all the days of your life. Yes. These three gentlemen up here are anointed by God and they have supernatural power that he's imparted to them yes. and they're going to walk out God's plan, purpose, and destiny for their lives in Christ. They are kingdom builders. Yes. They will make a difference yes. and they are our leaders for the future. Yes. So everyone, and I say this all the time and I'm going to say it again. Pray
prayed for our young people, yeah. prayed for them, take time out of your day to lift them up in prayer because they need our prayers for what's coming, for going toward them and where they're going to is a new place. It's an, even a new beginning, Pastor Don, yes. for all of us. So we need to encourage them to be focused on God and his word and digging in to be hungry and yeah. thirsty yeah. for God more than any other thing in their lives. He is the most important, and I am so proud yes. to know you three. And to yes, you. yes, I agree. Anyone else? Are you ready to pray over this? Yes. We're going to release the anointing. Uh, I've laid my hands on them. And please don't think I'm saying this out of any pride because it's so humbling what God has done in my life. Brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes. But he has anointed me with the ability to get well. Uh, my father-in-law said a few years ago, speaking of his family, and I didn't say this, he did, but he said, out of all these men in this family, I could take all of them and throw them out in the middle of the woods somewhere, and in a few days they, they would come back and report to me, and Don would be the one that had money in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> now, I didn't say that, he said it, but, but, I get to looking in the Word and when God said it about me, but He said it about you. It's the Lord that gives you the power to get well. Amen. Amen. Not for you so much that He may use you to establish His covenant in the earth. Amen. So the Lord wants to use the three of you guys to bring prosperity in your life, and that's not just money. Yes. That's although you need some money. <laughs> but he, he's anointed you to bring prosperity to the body of Christ. He's anointed you that you will carry his presence wherever you go. He's anointed you to direct lives to him. Amen. And he's anointed you to bring many into the kingdom of God. I had a prophecy years ago Sister Leslie was there and one of the prophecies was it went <coughs> on for about to Pam and I it went on for 30 minutes I guess but part of that prophecy was that in my latter days he would send a Samuel that I would glory over in my latter days because they would bring many to the kingdom of God. Mm. And I would see this with my own eyes. Mm. So I'm, these are my samples. Amen. Yeah. Now, in fact, this one's middle name Samuel. <laughs> these are my samples, and we're sending them forth now, they're, they're always going to be a part of us, but we're sending them forth to go into all the world yes. today Amen. to preach his glorious gospel. Yes. Not just speaking it, but living it. Yes. And the Lord says to you today, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, mm -hmm. even to the end of this age. And he said, as you humble yourself and come before my mighty hand, I will exalt you in due season. Amen. Yes. And I'll be with you wherever thou goest. Yes. So, Father, we speak this blessing over these young people. Yes, Jesus. We don't take this lightly no. today, Father. Mm -hmm. This is an awesome opportunity to touch these lives. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we declare blessing. Yes. Yes. Health, yes. prosperity in every area. Yes. Jesus, be anointed. And everybody who agrees said, Amen. 
So to to um, go on to the meal after church, if you could stay, please do. Originally, we thought it was just going to be a cake reception. We thought there was another function at 1 o'clock. So we just, you know, was going to do a, a cake reception. And that function, um, we were wrong or it got moved, whatever. Anyway, so then we said, okay, we're going to have a meal. So there's plenty. If you can stay, and like Pastor said, he doesn't want all the leftovers. So there's going to be chicken and pizza and sandwiches and whatever, and cake. So please stay and um, have a chance to, you know, mingle with the, the wise men here, the three wise men. <laughs> See, God said I can change a nation with one. Think what he did with three. <laughs> Besides, that's a number of God. <laughs> Okay, through a uh, through a God appointment, <laughs> I call it. I met my brother Lee. Uh, we'd known each other for a while, but we hadn't known each other until this past year, I think. The the Lord, you know, hemmed us up one day. He corralled us and put us in a place where we had to stop our busy schedule and see what he had to say. Amen. He had us captured. And that relationship began that day. And, and uh, I'll say that my life has been great, greatly enriched by meeting my brother Lee. And, uh, and he's got me excited about it too. So let me read you a little bit about uh, the, the man I'm about to introduce to you. He's a mechanical engineer by trade. He's currently working on the presidential aircraft, Air Force One. Uh, over the last 42 years, he's helped design and analyze satellites, the space shuttle, Mars lander, new NASA SLS, rocket which will send astronauts to Mars, as well as many other commercial aircraft. He's a self-taught physicist and has spent the last 12 years writing 250-page scientific paper describing the structure of the universe entitled The Quantum Dynamic Manifold, a geometric theory of the unified field which mathematically describes the innermost details of God's work of creation. That's quite amazing and impressive. God has blessed our brother. I introduce to you Mr. Lee Brady. Who is the one so proud to know? quite an introduction, so um, I'm going to try to stand up to it, but um, good morning, church. Good morning. I am part of you, and you are part of me. We're all together, a uh, part of the body of Christ, and I'm honored to be here today. Uh, as Don said, we, uh, get to, we got together as a kind of an appointment. And it was quite amazing because what my first interest in Don was that he 
knew about so many of the numbers of the Lord in his yeah. in the Lord's word. And I'm just sitting there in awe as he just he, he can just verbalize the numbers. And that's was right down my alley uh, because I'm extremely interested in the numbers in the works of God. Now, these two things have to happen together. The word of God has to be spoken and then his works come forth. So when we talk about numbers, it's a character of the Lord and that the numbers display both his word and his works. And we're going to be talking today a little bit more on the works of God and the numbers involved and what he has to say about his creation. And when I got started on this, I've been very interested in this, but before I get started, I wanted to introduce um, a couple of family members, my, our daughter Sharon and my son uh, Mason are here. Uh, we love them right next to my wife, Lori, and then Michael is extended family right here in the back, so please say hello to them. Uh, and uh, so when we first got started uh, on, on some of this energy, so all of the universe is energy. Uh, we just discovered some of this just in the last century. And this is a very exciting time to live, mostly because of the knowledge that we have. And I wanted to read uh, something from Isaiah 5, I believe. Hold on a second. So in Isaiah 5, he reads that many of us, their banquets are accompanied by a lair and a harp and a tambourine and flute and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord nor do they consider the work of his hands. Therefore, my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge and their honorable men are famished and the multitude is parched with thirst. So I'm going to be relaying some knowledge on the scientific side of things. And in my walk, in my personal walk, it has been the most extraordinary increase in faith. Now, when I took a, a walk over the, the divide by myself and the Lord, we walked together, and he revealed things to me, and he uh, gave me a new name, and I thought that nothing could ever get better than that, and that was before I even got started in this, okay? <laughs> and so it just keeps on going, and it's going to go. And so I'm very honored here that the Lord chose the Oasis Church for this to be first revealed, which I believe is going to actually uh, change the word. There are physicists in the world that are looking for the answers that have been already discovered. Yes. Amen. And this is being revealed, and it's the start of it is right here, right now, today, and the extravagant provision yes. gave the Lord. Okay? Yes. All right, so um, once we get started... Uh, I want to make sure who here has felt like they've been taught that religion and science are opposed to each other. Okay. I'm going to expose that lie. Okay. It's a lie. It's been taught to us. Uh, it's, when I first heard that or started thinking about it, it seemed to be infused in me and it didn't make any sense. And I'm going to show partially today only because of lack of time that that's a lie, and it's going to get an uppercut to the jaw today. Amen. We're, going to, Amen. we're going to rise above that. Amen. And when you see most physicists who actually go deep into the studies of the works of God, whether they know it's the works or not, they are led to come to God because they realize that all of this just can't happen. Okay. Now, we've heard about evolution, etc., like, hey, a lot of people, well, I feel like, yeah, you know, we started from this and that or some goo on the ground and we moved forward and we've turned into humans. Well, that can be some people's opinion, but when you start talking about the numbers and creation and how they affect 
everything that we know. Everything in the universe can be described by numbers, okay? Everything we know is equations. There's constants, there's a fine structure constant, there's pi, which all these, all these are numbers. All energy is numbers. And the numbers we're going to talk about uh, here in just a minute. You know, most, most mathematicians um, who do this professionally, they never stop and think about what is a number? What is a number? Are some of these symbols here on the, on the screen the number one? Is that first one the number one? Or is that second one the number one? Which one of those is the number one? Well, it turns out that none of those are the number one. The number one, the number one is a concept. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put together some prepositions for you, some, some concepts for you that, uh, that the first one, let's, let's begin with the number one is a concept. The number one is an idea, okay? The number one is, have, and where do ideas come from? The, I, the ideas have to come from a mind. They have to begin with a mind. And so once we, the second point about the number is that the number one is eternal. Now, we have to get an idea on a new way of thinking about numbers because we have given them very little respect. And we think that they're a tool of ours where we pick up a rock and we count how many apples we have or we go 80 miles an hour or there, there's something that we use to describe things. Well, they are in fact, what I have found to actually be much more than that. Okay, so another point is that the number one is eternal and it has always existed, okay? If it didn't always exist, when did it start existing? Well, some people might say, oh, well, when primitive man, you know, thought about it, that's when it existed. Well, how did he know that that was the number one? How did he know that someone else already didn't already discover it or find it? The number one is eternal. If it didn't, if it's not internal, when did it start existing? Okay. Next point, the number one is immutable, which means that it is never changing. It can't change. If it changed into something, what would it change into? The number two? It would not be the number one any longer. Now, I'm getting into this only because we have to so we can move on to the next point. So just bear with me on this, okay? Now, if the number one, one other thing, the number one must exist independently of human minds. Why is that? Because there was a time where human minds did not exist here. Okay? So, so if we retract, we say the number one is an idea, and if it's an eternal idea, then it has to come from an eternal mind if the number one is immutable and never changing, it has to come from a mind that never changes. And therefore, the number one must be come from an eternal and unchanging mind. Now, that sounds a little bit like God himself, doesn't it? And these are all, these are all true. And so, uh, if we go to the next slide. What we want to do now is get into Genesis, and in the beginning, <laughs> what a great way to start the word, right? So, in the beginning, the beginning of what? What's the beginning of? What? God is, God is I am, and it's outside of time. When we talk about beginning, there has to be time involved. So in the beginning has to be the beginning of this universe. And we read that he made the heavens and the earth, period. And this was a statement Moses made, I guess, on Pentecost. And 
He made that statement, but then notice that he wants to make sure that you understand, this is God speaking, that the earth was formless and void, which means he's starting to tell you now how the universe was created. He wants to make sure that you know that he created with the first sentence and the second sentence. He wants to let you know that I'm going to tell you how I created the universe. And we're going to start with, I want to make sure that you know that there's no earth and there's nothing. Now, it's a little bit hard to uh, try to visualize nothing because all of our perspective has everything to do with something. But in God's realm, there were three things, three things that existed in his kingdom prior to any created event that he had in this universe. There was darkness, there was the deep, and there was the waters. Those things existed with his spirit before anything happened. Now he shared this with us. Why did he share these things with us? He could have just said, I am the Lord, I made the heavens and the earth, and then move on. But he took the time, he wanted us to find out who he is. And so this is why he relayed this to us, so it could be even further revealed today. And even beyond what I'm going to share with you, there's a lot more, okay? And I'm sure that the more I stare at this, the more there's going to be other things that come out. So we're going to be talking about these first three things very briefly about what existed in God's kingdom. He was there with the darkness, okay? And... Uh, if we go back in the beginning, okay, so we had the darkness was over the surface. Now, the surface means that you have to have some sort of a uh, geometric, uh, like a piece of paper. It could be a piece of paper or a surface, could be a, a round, a sphere. So we're talking about space, and we're going to be do, we're going to be talking about space time. And so the surface is very important. Notice that not only did the deep had surface, but also, I guess is there another one in here? Or is there something on this spot? No. Is this interesting, every, anybody? Is this kind of? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, hello? Is that better? Okay, great. All right, so. Deep has a surface. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Okay? And the Spirit of God was moving, moving over the surface of the of the uh, of the waters. Now the waters, the waters is spoken 722 times in the Bible. So waters is very important both in his word and his works. And we're talking about the works side of it now, okay? So, most importantly, we have this, we're trying to define space-time, which is the scientific method. We're trying to use that today to try to find out all of the things about matter and dark energy. Now, darkness is not evil, okay? Uh, it, it actually exists with the Lord in his kingdom. And if, you, if we, we have found out in the scientific community that dark energy actually makes up 95% of the universe. Everything that we see, all the stars and the galaxies and the planets, is 5% of the energy in the universe. So darkness is okay. And darkness existed. The darkness exists, in, I believe, in God's kingdom only because he is the light in his kingdom. And without the darkness, everything would just be light. But he has to shine through the darkness, so it has a purpose. And so does the dark energy in this universe also has a purpose. Okay? And we're going to be talking about that. We have time allows. Okay. So, um, so we're trying to trying to move into what space-time is. So space, is a, there's a surface on the waters and a surface on the deep. So there's a, there's a volume, there's a space, okay? Now if we move in, go to that next slide on the darkness, uh, 
All we really know here from his word is that darkness eventually will be um, separated from the light. We really don't know darkness, but I believe he uses all of these words for us so that we might be able to understand a little bit what it is. Like, for instance, deep. What's the first thing that you think of with the deep? The first thing I think of is an ocean, okay? The depth of the ocean. Well, we can also have the depth of the earth. What's the, what's the depth of the earth? You start digging a hole, you'll dig down and go past the deep and start digging up to China, right? So the deep of the earth has to be the center of gravity of the earth. And if we, if we think about the surface being a sphere, then the perfect center of a sphere is exactly right in the center. And that's very, the Lord loves symmetry. We have found we, we love symmetry as his children. We're kind of made to like things that are seen equal. Our hands are symmetric, our bodies are symmetric. He makes things very symmetric, okay? So sphere is probably a good premise for what he's trying to describe here as far as what the deep is, okay? So now as we moved uh, into past the darkness, all, again, all we really know is the darkness was over the deep the surface of the deep, so it's not quite at the deep, it's at the surface, and then uh, if we move on to the waters, uh, we'll notice, and I guess on the next slide, uh, the waters is going to describe uh, what I believe to be uh, the vacuum of space and time. Okay, and we're gonna get into that just a little bit. And the darkness, because when we look out into space, we see darkness. So the Lord is going to use words to help us understand what he's trying to say about his creation. Okay, so now I want to give a little bit of idea uh, to premise before we get into his third verse where he creates light. I want to um, give you just an idea on what light is, what we have found, and only in the last hundred years have we realized some really major things in the scientific community about what light is. But I want to give you a premise on the size of his universe just a little bit that maybe you haven't quite heard before. This is the Milky Way. This is where we live. We're in that little point there says you are here. We're, we're actually between a couple of the big spirals and he's made it that way because it's really busy inside those spirals and we would probably be get bombarded with a lot more meteors and other things, etc. So we're kind of there in the middle. Now, when you think about light, we know that light travels very quickly. Uh, you know, we hear these big numbers, 300,000 meters per second, but I'm gonna give you some easies on how to consider that. So light can travel around the Earth eight times in one second. Light can travel from the sun to the Earth in eight minutes. And then, um, one light year is how long it takes, what's the distance for light to travel in one year. Now our, our single uh, Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. That means it takes, would take light traveling that fast, 100,000 years to go from one side of the galaxy to the other. Now, this is just one galaxy out of billions of galaxies. And the billions of galaxies, the farther we just set up the James Webb Telescope just this year. And um, the James Webb is able to see the farthest we've ever been able to see, which is about 13 and a half billion years into the past. And we can see that there are, to the surprise of many physicists, that there are fully formed galaxies that exist. They were thinking that it would just be a bunch of you know, nothing, because they think the Big Bang was about 14 billion years ago. So that means that the theory of science, which is great, using the scientific method, which means we have a theory, we present theories, and we try to either prove them or disprove them. Scientists are a bunch of doubters, so, you know, it's okay that they doubt faith. It's okay. It's okay. I mean, I have questions, right? I mean, I have like, what about this? It says this in the Bible. So I'm going to have questions. But science, using the scientific method, you have to say, well, we want to make sure this is truth, so we're not going to 
believe that until you can prove it. Because once it's proven, then we get to stand on it. We get to stand on the shoulders of those in the past who have spent their lives trying to prove the things of science. Okay? Now, a lot of people don't know this, but the scientific method actually got started in the monasteries way back. I think it was probably about six, uh, in Oxford University, for instance, and then Cambridge, and then came over here. The scientific method basically was the monks trying to find out the word, the truth of the word of God. And they, they got together and they would notice things like uh, particular parts of scripture that seemed to relate to each other, like for instance, Daniel and Revelations. And Daniel and Revelations come together, okay, and they would say, hey, we found these two scriptures and therefore, we have a new higher meaning of maybe what this scripture means because we've seen these two references. And so I propose that the truth of the word of God means X. And they bring that to their peers in the monastery. And if the, and if the most of the scientific or the monastery believe that this is actually truth, then it becomes truth. And it's because it's been proven, and it's been accepted by all the peers, and that's exactly what the scientific method is. They actually moved into the works of God and they created universities to find out the truth in the works of God. And that's what the universities are and that's why they exist today. Okay, now we've lost a little sight of that. But uh, nonetheless, uh, at least the scientific method is still sound. It's a great premise to find the truth. And that's what, guess what? This is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to seek him out. We seek him out, we will find him as a promise. And he has revealed himself greatly. Um, and so, so this is, a, this is a little premise on how big the universe is, about light, how, well, how fast it travels, how big the universe is, how small can the universe be? How small is the universe? Well, if we go to the quantum realm, we can, we're finding out many interesting things just in the last hundred years here. So this is, a, like I said, a very exciting time. So back early 1900s, a gentleman called Max Planck, he realized that some of the theorems of uh, Sir Isaac Newton, you might have heard back in the 1400s, 600 years ago, came up with some classical equations that he found that actually describe how the planets move. And we've been standing on that truth for hundreds of years until early 1900s when Max Planck came along and said, hey, if I use that theory on what we now know about the atomics, it doesn't work. Okay, so it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. It's a theory is a theory until it's either proven or disproven. It was just disproven, and that's okay. But now I'm gonna come back to you. <laughs> in this whole last hundred years we've done with quantum mechanics, in my opinion, actually also is going to be disprovable. Okay? And we're gonna go back actually to the classical side. I'm, I have found a way to bring quantum mechanics and classical together. And that's what science is all about. We, we go and we stumble and we find and we look and we seek the truth of God. So back to this, Max Planck came up and he actually figured out what they call the ultraviolet catastrophe. This is what the physicists called it because it just blew them all up. They had all these theories that thought would work, but the ultraviolet catastrophe just blew them out of the water, and so they tried to rush and figure out what, what can we do to figure out how light works. This is light. This is the first thing God's going to create. How does light work? Our theories in science were wrong 100 years ago about what light is. Okay, And so he did this experiment and found out that Light doesn't just come down like a glow. We look outside and we see the sun is out, the glow is coming and hitting the earth. 
it's not, it's a glow because there's trillions and trillions of what Max found to be a particle, a unit of energy that comes in, in packets. So there's trillions and trillions of packets that's getting and bombarding us. And to us, because it's moving so fast, it looks to us like a glow, okay? But at the same time, he realized, well, if this is true, then there has to be, there has to be a minimum separation distance in the universe. This was more important to me than it is probably to the scientific community because I, I saw the word separation. And if you read about, uh, if we read what actually it says, can we get to that slide where we actually go to the next one where God creates light? Okay. Then God said, let there be a light. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So the waters existed and he, this is the second thing he made, so I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, so this is the second thing. We're gonna to to talk about the waters, that's fine. Um, this is the second thing that he created. The first thing he created, I'm just gonna retract from it, was light, comma, and then he separated it between it and the darkness. So his first creative event was creating light and separating it. Second creative event, he created an expanse and separated it. His two first things, which are the most important part of what I'm gonna talk about, is separation events. We are living in a separated, fallen world, fallen, okay? This is well taught in the word. We're seeking to go back home. We feel it in our spirits. We know we're going back to the non-separated kingdom. Okay, now, he separated this for his own purpose. What is his purpose? Well, Let's keep going. <laughs> now, in Hebrew, the word expanse, go back please. In Hebrew, the word expanse means vault. It's a vault. If you are the creator of a vault and the owner of the vault, you know the combination to get in. What is the combination? Combination is Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? Amen. And we get to go. And notice here, God called the expanse heaven. God called the expanse heaven. We didn't call it that. So the expanse is where we're probably going to go. And it's a separated state. It's a vault. And his two first creative things were separation. So he had to create this universe in two separate, separated things. And when we, when we step back 12 years ago, when I was getting started on this, I was not expecting to find Genesis. I was okay. I was expecting to find free energy. My motivation was to figure out how Tesla did it. I figure out how Stanley Meyer actually made his water power car that he drove between the east and west coasts and back on 17 gallons of water. Okay? This is what I was looking for. But this is more importantly why I was looking for it. But that's what's so important about you guys right now. You might not know what your purpose is. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other and look and hold that lamp light out. And you're not sure what the next step is, but as long as, here's, here's the key, as long as you 
you know that next step is something that you enjoy doing, then do it. And when it meets the word of the Lord, okay? That way, because you know what? I get up early in the morning and I hear the songbirds. And why do they sing? They sing because they want to, and they enjoy it. And you know what? When they do, they glorify God because they're, yeah. they're happy, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and they're enjoying it, yeah. and they glorify him. He gets to have glory in each yes. one of us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay? So follow those things, and you'll find your way. You might think you're going one way. Like, hey, I want to do this because of this. Well, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you make this an abrupt turn and you're going to have to go that way because you want to. But your other goal didn't seem to be as important. So what I found here, I asked the Lord why he was sharing all this to me one day. And his answer was, of course, unexpected. And he said, I want more children. That's what he wants. And to have more children, it doesn't need more babies. We need somebody to show and give us knowledge so that we can see who God is. And that's when we have the second birth, is when we see him. Okay, so we're going to continue here on this separation. And now we're going to bring it back with the numbers. So... If, if we have numbers that we know that describe all of Earth, all of creation, all of the universe, can be explained with numbers, then numbers has to be an integral part of creation. It has to be a foundational part. Okay, but now we have the pesky thing of space. What's that all about? Okay? Because we don't necessarily need space, but this is what God created, and this is where we're living. How do we deal with space? And time. Okay? Because now God's outside of time, so he's how does the separation connect both time and space? Well, what are some of the things that we know? We know that <clears throat> time has to move, so space has to move. If space doesn't move, then time doesn't exist. If time doesn't exist, then space can't. And this is why we have, the scientific community actually believes and knows as truth that space-time is a single entity. I know that sounds strange, but it's the truth. Okay, so if we go to the next uh, next slide, which I think is a video. Well, let me introduce this video. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls, which just some of the most profound literature that was found uh, 13 miles east of Jerusalem and was just discovered mid-20th mid, mid century, like 1950s, right after the World War II, okay? A lot of these things have some extraordinary findings, but the gentleman in the next video is actually somebody who went there looking for uh, whatever these scrolls actually describe, which are some of the things that were used in the Holy Temple. And he actually discovered the Holy Temple incense. And he, I watched this video of him and I was just flabbergasted on what he said. So if we can play that. Taurus. I have absolutely no doubt this is good on this group not Taurus. This was the Holy Temple incense. If we continue to find the items listed in the Copper Scroll and continue to locate them in the order that they're listed in the Torah, then the next thing we should find is the ashes of the red heifer. All things will be restored. As even the Torah that Moses broke. Remember, he placed them back into the ark and God restored them. Moses wrote the Torah like the stones of the ark. Christian art has pictured the Torah as two tombstones. But that's not how they're described. In the book of Exodus, chapter 32 and verse 15, we read, And Moses went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony. In Hebrew it reads, Luchot, not slabs, but sapphires. 
these were diagonal shaped like the sapphire molecule. Wow. <laughs> now, you may or may not believe this, but there's a lot of other facts and data that actually support this. Okay? Now, I have a little bit of a premise about this because my birthday is in September and my birthstone is sapphire, so that may or may not be why I'm presenting this. <laughs> but anyway, if you take a look at some of the some other scripture, I'm going to get over here with my glasses. Okay, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I might give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. Okay, and they saw the God of Israel... Okay, this is in, Ex this is in uh, Exodus 24, 12, and 10. Now, right, notice like two verses between these. They saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heavens for clearness. So they did see sapphire. It was just two verses prior. And if we were going to try to guess make a proposition or a hypothesis on what was the material that the commandments were written on, then sapphire seems to be the only thing that uh, is would be a, a good first hypothesis. Okay, so now if we keep going, we also notice in Ezekiel 700 years later, in Ezekiel 122, over the heads of the living creatures, there was a likeness of an expanse. They actually saw the expanse, shining like all spiring crystal out, uh, spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one towards another, and each creature had two wings covering his body. And then when they went, I heard, Ezekiel, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters and the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, which is like many people speaking. Uh, the tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings and there came a voice from above the expanse. When he separated the waters, he separated the waters above the expanse to those waters below the expanse. Okay? And their heads, when they stood very still, they let down the wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, was likeness of a throne, in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of the throne was a likeness of a human appearance. So here we have Ezekiel and Exodus both stating sapphire, Stone, water, expanse, being seen. So not only does the Lord's word speak it in Genesis, but he reveals it to his prophets later on several times. And so let's take a look at it. Let's propose that the stone that was written on the commandments sounds like God because, you know, instead of, you know, common stone, I would think Ten Commandments being on something precious would make sense. So I'm gonna bring a couple other things to you, uh, to you on this. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, this is a tradition in Jewish uh, tradition about um, uh, what they use and they put, uh, it, let's just read the numbers 15. The Lord said to Moses, speak to people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord. To do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. So notice he picked blue as a reminder. You could have picked any color, but blue is the color of sapphire. And it's tied to the commandments, which he wrote, we believe, on Sapphire. Okay, next slide. 
This, my friends, is the molecular shape of the sapphire. And it is the octahedron. Okay, now again, to try to bring it back, we're trying to find out what space is. And the octahedron makes a space and the sapphire takes up space. It has a crystalline structure of the octahedron. Okay, and if we take a look at that, there's other evidence out there about the structure of space. Notice below there that we notice that particular galaxies and matter tend to form in octahedral lines across the lines between the vertices. You see on the top, this is vertex. There's six vertices on the octahedron and eight faces. The top are the four faces and the bottom, another four faces. Okay, so the sapphire seems to be a good place to perhaps start on maybe what the space should look like. Okay, we go to the next slide. And so we notice this point, I'm not gonna get into this right now, but if we try to figure out what space looks like, we need what he's created, the waters. What is the waters? The waters must move, otherwise there's no time. So basically I believe that the separation of waters here on this earth, on this universe has to move. And therefore, if we try to define what might be what the Lord makes on his waters, on his waters that he's standing on and his throne exists on, if he's standing above the expanse, where the waters above exist, that expanse has been seen by two prophets by uh, to be sapphire. Then we're gonna go ahead and claim that, that perhaps space must be in the shape of the sapphire molecule, which is the octahedron. Now, how does, if we have that, how does this particular octahedron how can this define space? This is an octahedron. This is from an artist that I found online because I was very interested in the octahedron. It's one of Plato's five platonic solids, which are extremely uh, symmetric. And uh, there's only five of them. So this is a very unique shape. It has what, you might, what we might call a deep in the center of it, okay? <coughs> It has perhaps water around it, and we have waters perhaps that exist at the center, okay? Now, the artist I found this from, he does this as artwork, and he was getting together with all of his other artists, he said, for 20 years, and I called him one day, and I said, hey, I'd like to get one of your, uh, one of your art that makes this octahedron, and he said, because he asked me why, and I said, because I believe that the structure of the universe is made from the octahedron. And he says, oh my God, I've been waiting for you for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and he and his other buddies, working this from an artistic side, realized somehow, I don't know, he passed away a month later. And uh, he somehow, they knew that this was the structure of space. I don't know how, I never, I know, never able to get him. He was in a different part of the country. But we have to ask, how does time exist in a space? Well, it has to move. Now, how can the octahedron move? I'm gonna set the mic down for a minute. If we have charges at each one of these corners, the charges have to move because it has, has to have an electromagnetic essence. All right. Thank you, man. All right. It has to have an electromagnetic essence to it because this is one of the four forces of the universe. So electromagnetics, we can just assume that there's charges at all six of these, but if they can't move, you would have to move space like this and the one adjacent to it couldn't move. This is a unit of, of energy, a unit of energy just like the photon and just like the proton and the neutron, everything I actually, my 250 page paper showed that this actually 
agrees with all of our experimentation for what all the protons are made up of, what the quarks are made up of, everything. Okay, so this has some good basis behind it. We're not going to have time for today, but if you're going to move this, it has to spin. Cool. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Cool. Can you see each one of the triangles, the trinities, at each one of these points? You see how they all want to spin, and they are separated. They're separated between the two. And notice when I'm spinning the top and the bottom one here, they're not moving. They are staying steady with each other. But it looks like the other ones are the only ones moving. Well, that's not the fact. It's just because I have to hold it. These also spin. I could just pick these other two and do the same exact thing, and those are spinning, you see? So they're all actually spinning together. Now, notice the shape that it makes here. This is an Archimedes solid, and it's actually very unique. Very unique because it also has perfect symmetry. Perfect. You can't get more perfect geom geometric symmetry than those two. And if you were going to create that shape from the number one, there's only one shape. If you're going to create a shape that could actually specify what space-time is made out of, there's only one shape using two laws that we find in the universe. Two laws. One law is doubling. Everything that God makes in life doubles, cells double, double helix, plus, minus, left, right, up, down. There's always an equal and opposite. If you use that law and the law of symmetry, which is beautiful, it's beauty, beauty and science, the only shape that can come from that is this shape, nothing else, nothing. Okay? And notice here that to have the octahedron, there has to be a separation of charge. You can't have a point and then have time and have something to actually move around in. So this shape um, has to be the waters, because waters, why? Waters move, they give life. These are the reasons, actually, in my paper, I redefine what early physicists from the last 500 years called the ether. And we start to call it different things now, zero point energy, dark energy, all this energy that we know is out there, we've always known is out there. We just, are, as scientists, are seeking to try to find that energy. But I'm calling it the waters because it mimics exactly what the water wants us to know. <laughs> you can't argue with it. So here's some of the reasons why I call the ether the water. Okay, it's clear. You can see through it. I mean, it's right here between my hands. There's air in here, but if I took a vacuum and took all the air out, there would still be a space there. Okay, the waters are there. And the dark energy, like I said, makes up 95% of the energy. So basically, the energy that's between my hands right here probably could power the entire planet. Okay? That's the abundance of the Lord. Okay? We're not here, to, we're not supposed to be paying for his abundance. Okay? That's the greed of men, basically. That's all that is. Okay? It's the second thing about water. It's a construct that conducts entropy, which is the first law of thermodynamics law law of thermodynamics that the Lord set forth in his waters. Entropy means that anything that is in the waters wants to be homogeneous and just disperse it till it's all equal and perfect, okay? Entropy, first law of thermodynamics. So the third thing about water, it appears isotropic and homogeneous, which means it looks all the same. If you look into a pool of water, it's like, it's all pretty much the same, and it's until it's disrupted. When it's disrupted, it moves like waves. That's what dark energy does. That's what gravity does. That's what 
all the things in this universe, it moves in waves. Frequency is a wave. All light is first creative thing is frequency. All it is is frequency. Now we only can see a small part of that frequency, very small visible part, but it's light nonetheless. That's why when he created light, it was not visible because it didn't have to be. He only gave us the eyes so that we could see the visible part. I mean, other animals can see different frequencies, but our eyes only see a certain small part of that. Okay, so frequency is time. Frequency is defined as how many times does it spin per second? And it turns out that light spins, you know, the, the car engine is, has its higher torque. In my truck, you know, if I run 3,000 rounds per minute, that's the highest torque I can get out of my engine. Well, that turns out to be about 50 revolutions per second, okay? That's how fast the engine turns. Light rotates on the average of seven trillion times a second, okay? <laughs> it's got lots of energy. <laughs> That's a little more than 50, <laughs> okay? So if I'm looking for torque, I'm gonna go to light, man. I'm gonna get that light. Now we can feel his energy from the sun. If we put your hand out, you're getting some energy, you're getting power, the Lord's power, okay, his abundance. You got lots of light out there, okay? And then it also can move while it's spinning at 70 trillion times a second. It also can move at 300,000 meters per second. That's okay, so light was a very important part of his uh, first creative event, okay? So, but it has, uh, so if we continue on why this is waters, this is what I call the quantum dynamic unit, Q to you, okay? Because it's quantum, it's dynamic, quantum meaning it's a separate single thing. Don't get too freaked out about quantum. Oh my gosh, you said quantum. What is that? That just means there's like one of them. Okay, and there's another one, and then there's another one, and they all, they all act kind of independently, but together. Okay? So, um, so each QU unit source, like a water molecule, shares its components with adjacent units. The water molecule does that. Okay, the world defines waters as existing prior to universal creation of that, the word. That's another good reason. It easily combines with and surrounds and carries foreign entities around with it as it dilutes them into itself, attempting to create the highest overall form of symmetry. And that is the purpose of this structure is to maintain symmetry at all costs that's a law that he created in this for this for the waters in this universe okay so one more thing now we're going to try to combine what his numbers are and we started with with uh, with this space with the space time. Now this ice and all, I mean, I've come up with a lot of theories here, but I have, I have 250 pages of equations. I throw a couple out there. Uh, you know, those are the small ones, okay? <laughs> so some of this stuff, you know, is pretty intense and it's necessary if we are to prove God's works because he's given us the minds and the knowledge to do so, so let's go ahead and do that, shall we? Yes. yes, let's find out his works because, you know, the word of God, I look at it as like a left jab, right? Boom, boom, trying to hit something against Satan. But his works, man, it's like an uppercut, right? There in the jaw, takes it down, okay? So both together, just like faith and works, his word and works are the same thing. It's, the, it's how we're supposed to proceed. Okay, so next time somebody says something to you about science being opposed 
to religion, that's fine, but religion is not opposed to science because it started in the monasteries, and now if we can remember that, it'll continue in his work. Now, that, that's the whole reason we're doing this today. We've lost sight of it. Some people have lost sight of it, but that's the purpose of it, just to find him. That's the main purpose of everything that I'm actually describing. So, separation. Have to have separation for the universe to exist, so that's why he did the first two things. And then he had the canvas to paint onto. He had to create time and space with light and the vault. That's how he created time and space because light takes time to travel. It's the energy packet and space is required for it to travel in. Can't have one without the other. So as far as the numbers go, the numbers go, when I was showing you about that plank length, I don't know if we can go back to that slide. I, I tend to go off in these rabbit trails. Uh, you know, that one grace with the large, lots of zeros on it. I think it's maybe back two or three slides. If we look at the plank length, maybe one more, one more, way back. <laughs> We look at the Planck length, it's, I was trying to tell you how small the universe is, we kind of see how big it is, but we can also see how small it is. And this is important. All right. Um, that's okay. Um, the Planck length is what Max Planck, he found when he did his experiment about light. And what he found was that there had to be a separation that cannot be. It makes no sense to all of science right now. You can't go small. If you go smaller than that, all everything just implodes. There's no, there's no universe. There's nothing. And we've we've determined this scientifically. There is. That's it. So you can see how many zeros. Okay. So when I say 8.5 times 10 to the minus 14, that means it's 8.5 but you have to add 14 zeros in front of it. So it's 0 0.00000, and that's how small, this is how small, plank, plank, you can't go anything smaller than that, proven scientifically that this universe has a separation and a vault that you cannot get smaller than. It's not possible. Now, we don't know how big the universe is, but we do know how small it is. And I'm proposing in my paper that the size of the QDU is the size of the Planck length. That's how many of them there are. And it's continuous. There's one that's attached to the next one that's attached to the next one. And all of them together make a C of waters that God describes in Genesis. Amen? Amen. Isn't that something? Yeah. Isn't the Lord awesome? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is creation. So, uh, thank you. Conception to coming out into the open. We moved into this building, and about 19 months ago, right now, a prophetic apostle called me up and he said, The Lord 
Lord said for me to call you and tell you today that the oasis is a proton. <laughs> <laughs> that goes along with a lot of you know you don't expect to hear God say things like that. You know. <laughs> and then then the Lord started showing me some scripture that had the meaning of the word that was translated into our English meant proton. So anyway, that that I was. Uh, That's why I love this guy. I mean. <laughs> This is like this head of knowledge that just doesn't end. You know? That's why we spent hours out there like, Don, I think we better get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? When you spend time like that, God always makes it up to you. Amen. Yeah. You can get more done in less time right after that than you've ever even imagined. But anyway, this kind of thing is important to us and to God and you know, he says in Proverbs 4, verse 7, get wisdom. In all you're getting, get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. But he also says in Hosea 4, verse 6, that his people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This is knowledge, God's knowledge that we've been getting this morning. And he also says in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us, where he's telling us to say to him, teach us to number our days. Why? That wisdom might come to you. See, with these numbers that God put in his word, and his word is full of numbers, they are to, they are to bring wisdom we, we've got a heart of wisdom. We're hungry for his knowledge and his wisdom and his truth. <clears throat> so we just thank the Lord for today. Amen. And, uh, how about just praising the Lord? Yeah. Hey, I'm going to be no other, no other Sunday morning church service had this coming. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you mean. Uh, uh, how about it? <laughs> but it is, but we are the proton. Yeah. Proton, you know, proton actually means uh, a proton actually has a, or a proton church or a proton <coughs> anything has the, actually it is a prototype. It, that's where we get our word prototype from. Prototype. Let me give you a definition of prototype. A radical new model. <laughs> uh, you bunch of radicals. Yes, hallelujah, yes! Thank you, Lord. The Lord is good. Anybody have anything? Anybody want to say something? Anybody need to say something? Or are you just... <laughs> timing. He didn't reveal any of this stuff hundreds of years ago. Now it's ready. Now we are ready. And we're going to move in it. It's time. Yeah. This is the time. And it's it's perfect timing. It's great. I mean, it's a very exciting time to live with all this information. Everybody has information of the entire planet. Okay? That probably had to happen for this to actually happen because uh, the universe is not a simple thing to you know, explain. So, uh, you know, my little 250 pages is like you know, just the beginning of this. And that doesn't even touch life. I mean, life is just beyond even this. This is just the structure of space. Life is one of the names of the Lord. And, but so is truth. And I believe the numbers, you can't have 
you can't have a opinion like, well, I kind of feel like two plus three is six. That's how I feel about my social media. Huh? You can't have an opinion. You're gonna to have to leave and go to another universe because two plus six is five here in this universe. Period. And you can't have an opinion about it. And that's true. That's what's so nice about the numbers. So I'm thinking that numbers are basically maybe another form of his truth that he calls himself that you cannot argue against. Amen. It's the God equation. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Amen. 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 If you don't get anything out of it, he's amazing. He's greater than that. Anything we can say about our Creator is not good enough, but we do the best we can. So, And He honors that. So when you worship Him, just tell Him how awesome He is. Yes. All right, we're going to have. Nobody else has anything. Or you like me this week. I got to meditate on this a while. Thank you. Meditate on it day and night. It's the Lord of God. Amen. Well, let's bless the food. Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for sharing your knowledge through Brother Lee. We look forward to hearing more. And we thank you for the food that you provided. We thank you for these seniors. Thank you for the day we honored the seniors. We got this knowledge and wisdom as a major point for them to move forward in their life with. And we just thank you and praise you for the food. We thank you that will bless us and empower us to better serve you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Today is the first day of the new Hebrew month. And it's a month of extravagant abundance. I think we've heard and have some abundance. And it, to me, it's extravagant. Today, what we heard was extravagant abundance for us. And the stone for this month is a clear crystal. <laughs> You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you, our visitors. We pray that you were blessed. Thank you.